Gary and Sandra Hogburn, they're both microbiologists of long standing and uh, Gary uh, is from the Wirral, works for uh, Feedwater Limited as a manager of their analytical lab and has advised various bodies on uh, and helped in the uh, research on Legionella and just a warning to you all if you've got hot tubs he's had to address a recent outbreak of Legionella due to a hot tub party so just you know take note of that um, he's also a volunteer for LAST, which stands for La Latin American Sea Turtles. And I dare say we'll be help hearing more of that um, in this talk. Uh, but he's been helping them in conservation work in Costa Rica. Um, and Sandra is also a microbiologist at Port Sunlight. And the title of the talk is Hatching a Plan, and it's about leatherback turtles. So over to you, Gary. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you tonight. I'll just uh, share the screen at the start of um, the presentation. Okay, so um, it's a, a pleasure to be able to speak with you tonight. It's uh, sadly, though, with COVID, of course, a lot of what we did in Costa Rica appeared to have happened a long time ago. We had to drag a few memories back uh, in order to, uh, uh, to complete the, uh, the presentation. But I would like to start with an important proviso. You know, Sandra and I uh, here tonight, we're not claiming to be uh, marine biologists, okay, because we are microbiologists who are uh, uh, an interest in, in conservation. So we're hoping that at some point today, uh, the chief scientist from the, um, um, uh, uh, from the exercise, uh, Fabian Canasco, will be able to join us from Mexico. But uh, he, you know, we, we're relying really on the, um, uh, on the ability of the internet to bring Fabian in. So if there are any really technical questions about turtles, then hopefully he will be able to, uh, uh, to answer them for us this evening. Um, we were volunteering for an organisation called Biosphere Expeditions, and one of the organisations Biosphere were working for was this one here that Michael mentioned. It's uh, Latin American sea turtles. So they are a, um, an organization that is uh, helping to conserve uh, turtles um, across Latin America. Uh, they also work with uh, WIDECAS, so the wider Caribbean sea turtle network uh, just within Costa Rica. So it's a multi-agency exercise to try and uh, uh, improve the conservation of, uh, of turtles on, uh, uh, in Costa Rica and indeed across Latin America. So, you know, we've got a situation uh, in the planet at the moment with I, um, Earth is currently assessed as undergoing a, a mass extinction event. I think we're all largely aware of concerns around this, largely due though to five areas of human activity. So we're, we're uh, concerned about habitat destruction, including climate change, the introduction of invasive species. So a great example is, uh, of course, the, the grey squirrel, long studied and long understood. Um, pollution is an increasing concern and causing uh, problems for wildlife generally, as is human overpopulation, because uh, human overpopulation inevitably, of course, leads to um, overharvesting. So a good example of that is uh, uh, fish stock depletion. Overall, then, it adds up to a depletion of biodiversity and damage to the biosphere as a whole. So, you know, we were sat around one day thinking, what could we do as this, uh, about this rather as um, individuals? And generally we were uh, of the opinion that we were fed up with the beach holidays that we had done and we were looking to do something different. Uh, but we also wanted to do something that was uh, challenging. So we first started off by doing a fair bit of uh, cycling and, and walking for, uh, uh, for charities. So that took us to quite a few uh, different parts of the world. Um, but once the children had, had left home, you know, we found we had more opportunity to uh, look a little bit further afield and look for something which was uh, a little bit more involved. And one um, lunchtime at work for one of us, that's her, not me, okay, <laughs> um, an internet search for conservation work found the organisation called Biosphere Expeditions. So Biosphere are uh, an organization that was uh, founded 20 years ago with the aim of promoting so-called citizen science uh, together with conservation. So uh, it's a non-profit organization with offices in, uh, in Germany and until recently the United Kingdom. Um, but the key factor for us was that it is scientist led at all levels. 
So the management of the organization is led by a scientist, Dr. Matthias Hammer, um, and at all levels there are scientists involved down to the individual uh, project leaders, when, project leaders rather, when you uh, arrive on the site. Now Biosphere are currently running uh, 12 uh, projects, so they're running projects from uh, Arabia, on which we'll touch a little bit later, uh, all the way to Tian Shan, so that's Arabia, A to T alphabetically, uh, for those of you who don't know Tian Shan is in Kyrgyzstan, uh, and they're running with target species really from everything from insects uh, to elephants, so the opportunity to uh, work with all these species is obviously uh, uh, quite attractive. They are volunteer holidays okay so you go along to these um uh, these trips as your uh, as your holiday and you do have to sort your travel out yourself so there's an element of uh, uh of exploration going on here when you're trying to uh, uh, to plot a route to some of the more far-flung um destinations um but they are trying to encourage international volunteer participation with local workers so the aim of many of these projects is to involve the local communities to improve their own um, uh, conservation efforts in those communities. And this was certainly true of the trip to Costa Rica, as we will, as we will shortly see. So Biosphere has been responsible for over 200,000 hours worked in citizen science and wildlife conservation and research. Excuse me. And they've also um, spent over two and a half million uh, uh, directly into conservation projects worldwide, two and a half million euros, that is with over a million euros put into local projects and communities as in-kind donations. So it's not rich Westerners dropping in on projects uh, without any benefit. You know, the aim is to get the local community to a position where they can do uh, an awful lot of this work themselves. So Biosphere has some international recognition. So, uh, you know, the um, IUCN, the UN Environment Agency, uh, Marine Conservation Society, amongst others, are uh, important agencies in um, ensuring that the, uh, uh, the work that they do is scientifically valid. And they are also members of the European Citizen Science Association. So we do keep seeing the phrase citizen science pop up. You know, there are lots of uh, exercises with, for instance, the um, Royal Society of Protection of Birds, and I think the Royal Society of Biology also run citizen science schemes where they're asking people to report on what they see uh, in their locality. So it's, um, it's a developing field and it's good to be uh, involved within it. So every biosphere expedition though needs an iconic species and preferably three <laughs> because this gives you something to get your teeth into. So in this particular instance, uh, the leatherback sea turtle was the core species. So Demichelis coriaceae is the uh, species name, but they also have on the um, uh, Atlantic coast of, um, of Costa Rica, um, green turtles, so Colonia midas, and Eretobichelis imbricata, the hawksbill turtle. And we saw evidence of green turtles and hawksbill turtles uh, throughout our trip. But we're going to speak mostly about leatherback turtles because our trip was timed to, in to um, um, include the peak leatherback nesting season, which typically is April and May uh, on the Atlantic coast of, uh, of Costa Rica. Now, leatherback turtles are classed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list for the Atlantic population only. So there are, um, excuse me, I beg your pardon. Um, leatherbacks are the largest of all of the living turtles, uh, the fourth heaviest reptile on earth, and they weigh up to 300 kilograms each. So they are huge uh, creatures. And they have the widest range of any sea turtle as well. So they range up to both polar regions. And one study, or in one study, a turtle was tracked over 20,000 kilometers over a 647 uh, day period. So they travel huge distances. They can also dive very, very deep indeed. So they dive beyond a thousand meter for their prey, which is typically jellyfish. So they can dive deeper than most whales. Okay, so they're able to uh, get right to the bottoms of uh, parts of the ocean. But unlike the other sea turtles, leatherbacks lack a bony shell, so they have an oily and flesh carapace rather than a, uh, rather than a hard bony shell. And you certainly appreciate their size. If, if you're walking along a beach in the Caribbean in the dark and you fall into a leatherback's tracks on the beach, then you'll know about it because they leave huge tracks like a, like a giant JCB. And that in the dark, it's sometimes the only way that you can actually uh, determine that there has been a, a turtle nearby, um, especially when the beach is black sand, so you're not really getting much in the way of, uh, of reflected light. 
So there are three um, major genetically distinct populations of, of, uh, of leatherback sea turtles. So the first one is the Atlantic population, which is what we were involved in uh, in studying. Uh, there's an Eastern Pacific population, so on the other side of the um, um, of the uh, Costa Rican coast, and also a separate genetically distinct uh, Western Pacific population. And the species as a whole is classed as vulnerable on the IUCN's red list, but the Atlantic subpopulation is considered to be critically endangered. So recent estimates of nesting populations show uh, um, that 26,000 to 43,000 people's nest annually, but that's a dramatic decline. So Eckert and, his, and the team estimated um, that in 1980, there were up to 115,000 nesting females. So a decline down to sort of 26 to 43,000 is obviously a very serious decline indeed over what is a relatively short space of time. So what problems are there? Well, the key problem that the project in Costa Rica was going to address was that turtles and their eggs are taken by humans for consumption. So there's a well-established black market for, for turtle eggs and meat. And this is made worse by the fact that uh, although trading leatherback turtles eggs is illegal in Costa Rica, trading other turtles eggs is still legal. So people who poach eggs can often take them to, uh, to restaurants and markets for sale and claim that they are not leatherback eggs. So they will claim that they are, uh, that they are uh, hawksbill or green turtle eggs, which sale of which is still legal. So it's very difficult to enforce uh, the ban that they have and poaching is still uh, endemic in the area. Typically, of course, uh, any, in any biological situation, you get um, um, things that are populations lost to predators and indeed to infection. But that reduction of 77% of nesting females on the Atlantic coast is, uh, is very serious indeed. We also know that you get a, a loss of turtles from bycatch and from uh, boat strikes as well. And the, uh, the oily carapace of the, uh, of the turtle does make them more vulnerable to boat strikes because they're not as protected as the turtles that have a, a rigid shell. I think we've all seen video footage and photographs of uh, turtles wrapped up in plastic waste, you know, bits of plastic rope and so forth. So um, one aspect of pollution of the marine environment. And we know that turtles often mistake things like plastic bags for jellyfish. So that is uh, obviously causing some loss among the turtles as well. And one thing that's really uh, developing understanding is that uh, turtles, like other reptiles, demonstrate temperature dependent sex selection. So they, um, the outcome of, uh, of a nest, whether the majority are male or female, depends on the temperature. Um, so where you get warmer nests, then you tend to get females. And where you get um, cooler nests, then you tend to get males. So as they said to us, it was uh, hot chicks and cool dudes. So uh, quite an easy way to remember it. But as the planet warms up, of course, we're seeing far greater numbers of females and fewer males, so that the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the gender difference is becoming quite striking and more problematic. And as the planet gets warmer, that is going to increase uh, even further. And finally, we have uh, rising sea levels, which are destroying some of the nesting sites that they uh, routinely use on the uh, uh, on the beaches across the Atlantic and the Pacific. So those uh, nesting sites have been lost as uh, as sea levels rise. So how is biosphere intended to help? Well, they started work in um, Costa Rica in 2015. Biosphere are recruiting local people as research and conservation assistants, partly because some of those people are involved in poaching. So they've been historically involved in poaching and that was indeed how many of them made a living. If you give them some alternative to poaching, then obviously you've got a chance that they will turn away from it. And there was one really remarkable moment with one of the team members who was uh, on the beach, a former poacher. and. Uh, there'd been some information that a nest had been laid in an area of beach which was now covered with flat sand entirely. Um, and we walked over to this area of the beach and uh, he took an area of about 10 metres square and he walked up and down the, uh, uh, the beach and eventually he said, the nest is here. There was nothing different at all for the surface of, that, uh, of the sand, but he was able to pinpoint the nest just from his experience of years uh, as a poacher. So he's now a poacher turned gamekeeper and he works with Biosphere to help stop uh, others from poaching. And 
this input is urgently needed. It's a really isolated community. When you have to uh, get on a boat and sail through the canals, you appreciate how isolated it is. It's also a very vulnerable community with very few educational and employment opportunities. So it's important that these are, are uh, um, uh, that, that these actions are taken to encourage them to turn away from damaging the, uh, uh, the future of this particular uh, species. So this project was different from a lot of the other biosphere projects though. Many of the other projects are simply about enumerating, counting and, and measuring of all these uh, organisms that they're working with. In Costa Rica, this was direct conservation action. So it wasn't just a case of counting the number of eggs that came, uh, that hatched, uh, the number of nests that were laid and so forth. This was physically removing the eggs to a place of safety and patrolling the beach in order to deter poachers from actually taking the eggs in the first place. So there was a d definitive or a definite rather um, um, end result, if you like, of being able to save uh, hatchlings. And we'll look at some numbers later to show you uh, exactly how many um, hatchlings could be saved. So here is the uh, study site then. So you can see it's on the um, Atlantic coast with a, a, a beach on the Caribbean. Um, so it is known as Pacoare Beach in the province of Limon and the Costa Rica district of Martina. So you can only get to the site by boat through the, the canals of the Tortuguero region. So it's really remote and isolated area, but it is rich in wildlife and nature. Sandra and I were able to go to Costa Rica a week before and actually hire a car and spend some time traveling around and enjoying the rest of the country, including the Pacific coast. But by the time we got back to, uh, uh, to Lima to join the Biosphere Project, we were ready to go to, uh, uh, to the Atlantic coast and to, uh, uh, and to see what was there. Um, before we got there, typically we were only there for you know, the best part of two weeks, um, somebody else has to do the hard work. So before we got there, the staff removed 100 cubic metres of sand, so 10 metres by 10 metres at a, a full depth of one metre. So dug the sand out by hand, carried it down the beach to the sea and washed it in seawater uh, and then left it to sun dry to reduce the infection and any insect colonisation. Um, the staff kept referring to this as sterilising the sand and as a microbiologist we were uh, both of us looking at each other and that's not sterilisation you know but um, I think we all know what they were trying to achieve and uh, it wouldn't be the first time the word sterilisation has been misused would it. Um, so once the sand was put back into the uh, hatchery area it's all fenced off to uh, uh, prevent ingress. The area is divided into a grid of 210 nest slots with string. So you literally just put a, a checkerboard pattern down and then each nest that was to be installed is allowed a blank space next to it. So you do get a, a, a draft board pattern, if you like. So you have a, a nest, a space, a nest, a space. And then on the next row, you'll have a space, a nest, uh, a space, a nest. So you've got this uh, checkerboard pattern. And the aim of that is to reduce the risk of um, infection. Uh, cross infection from one nest to another and to reduce oxygen depletion but also to uh, 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 to ensure that the temperatures were independent of each other rather than affected by what was happening in a nest next door. So half the hatchery area then was shaded to create different temperature zones so if you've got temperature dependent sex selection you want to make sure that you have some differences in temperature within the hatchery so you can see uh, on the photograph here um, this is what the hatchery looks like. You can see the string on the bottom of the uh, uh, of the photograph and the, the nest uh, bags that were uh, placed on top of it. Uh, but you can also see the shade here where the, uh, the black shading to give us uh, some of the area uh, ultimately um, uh, covered up to reduce the temperature. The little tin shelter on the right hand side of the, uh, of the photograph here is uh, where you get to sit whilst you're doing hatchery duty. So I can tell you that my article in The Biologist was first written on my iPhone at about three o'clock in the morning during a Caribbean thunderstorm, uh, sat underneath that, uh, that tin roof, watching the rain fall uh, all around, uh, in between walking out and, uh, and inspecting the hatchery every 15 minutes in the, uh, uh, in the very uh, substantial rain. So that was all done largely before we arrived and our job really was to help to populate this hatchery with as many uh, turtle eggs as, uh, uh, as could be recovered. So in order to do this there were 10 citizen scientists who uh, attended so they were represented from uh, five countries so there were three of us from the United Kingdom including a, uh, a medical consultant from, uh, from Boston in Lincolnshire 
There were three people from uh, Germany and we've been joined tonight by one of them in, in George. So welcome, George. There were two Canadians, uh, in, including a, a well-known filmmaker from, uh, from Canada, uh, one uh, lady from uh, New York and one from Australia, who was also intending to write up the project for publication in a, in a travel journal. But generally, we're from a, a wide range of professions. So Sandra and I were the only two biologists there of any, of any description. So we had a core task. The core task was nightly beach patrolling in the dark, on black sand without any light. Um, so you, uh, the beach um, uh, section is about 7.1 kilometers with the uh, headquarters uh, about two kilometers in. So a typical beach patrol would involve walking about 10 kilometers uh, in the dark. So we do that each night. We also had to um, keep the hatchery secure because towards the end of the project, there was somewhere in the region of 12,000, 13,000, eggs in this hatchery that is a rich resource for anybody who wants to steal them okay so the hatchery had to be maintained 24 hours a day uh, for the during the whole time that we were there um we also intending to do nest relocation so we're not just talking about deterring poachers when you found a turtle on the beach you had to um, um, wait for the turtle to lay her eggs or catch her eggs as she was laying them and then take them physically to the hatchery in order to uh, make sure that they were kept secure. Because if you left them on the beach, there was a very strong prospect that they would be taken by, uh, by poachers. We also tried to gather data on uh, measurement of nesting females. So we're measuring the size of their, of their shells and so forth, the, the width and length of carapace and also looking for any tags because many of the adult females have been on the beach before and have been able to tag them. If they were without a tag or their tag was nearly dropping off, then they could be, re they could be tagged for the first time or, or re-tagged as appropriate. And that enables us to help track these uh, uh, females and see how many times they return uh, to the beach. And then we also got the opportunity to um, measure hatchlings. So there are fewer more beautiful sights, I think, in the world than watching a bucket full of turtle hatchlings uh, um, running about in the bottom of the of the bucket, awaiting their chance to be released onto the beach to uh, uh, to go into the sea. But uh, you know, we were um, part of the project involved taking the hatchlings and uh, and gathering biometric data on them, including things like weights and size. Um, and we also had to do, make do with, or had to do rather, hatchery maintenance and construction. So we're looking at the, making sure the hatchery didn't fall apart. So that involves uh, inspecting the nest, making sure there were no holes in the nest. A critical task is to remove any potential predator that gets in, and the most of the potential predators turned out to be crabs, of which there were many, many thousands of crabs uh, on the site, and uh, you couldn't walk about at night without stepping on a crab. They were so common. It was uh, um, quite a, a fantastic migration towards the beach, which sometimes took in the hatchery as well. So on arrival, uh, knowing what we're doing this, the most important thing is to train the participants. Now, as most of these people, including ourselves, are not turtle biologists or marine biologists, we had to sit at, go through a, a day's training programme. So um, most of the activities were then uh, conducted under the supervision of trained staff members. So it's not a case of training these people with limited background in science and then say, go out and do it. You know, you're always accompanied by the trained scientist who was able to... Uh, uh, to do most of the complex work and almost all of the turtle handling, that's all of the hatchling handling uh, was done by the trained scientists to avoid uh, any stress and, uh, and damage to the, uh, to the hatchlings themselves. There have been studies, uh, Evans and Birchinoff are, are quoted here, um, demonstrated that given training volunteers can perform straightforward tasks as competently as more experienced scientists. So the key word there is straightforward. No one is expecting people to go in there and work complicated pieces of equipment or to handle uh, animals that are either dangerous or, or, or stressed or you know, subject to um, any form of damage from people who don't know how to handle them. You know, it is about doing the straightforward task, but if they're done correctly, then they produce very valuable uh, information. So here's our 
training session um, sat on the beach or stood on the beach being spoken to by uh, by the scientists involved uh, in the project this particular session involved the process of how to dig an artificial nest because once you'd harvested the eggs from the turtle you have to rebury them in the hatchery so you have to rebury them in a uh, a nest that looks like a turtle's nest in all other respects so we had to learn how to uh, dig a nest um, uh, like a turtle so it has to be a certain depth and it has to be a certain shape um, so that's what this particular uh, project was uh, was all about after the training, we started the nightly patrols. So you got on staggered patrols, a maximum of eight persons because you don't need uh, too many, but you, you literally go out in a line, um, almost holding the person in front of you because it's so dark that you can't see. You know? I think most nights we were out, there was a Caribbean thunderstorm out at sea, so quite a distance away. Uh, so you've got occasional flashes of lightning, which help you to, uh, uh, to see some things. But for the most part, you're stumbling along in the dark because we don't use white light on these uh, uh, on these patrols because the uh, the turtles can be very much disturbed by uh, white light. If you saw a white light on the um, on the beach, that was almost certainly a poacher because the poachers aren't as careful as the uh, uh, as the last and the biosphere staff. So every nightly patrol was guided by a trained staff member, lasted an average of four hours, but depending on the nesting activity, and usually you would do about 10 kilometers. So it's, uh, it's hard work. You do need to be reasonably uh, fit in order to do them. If we found a poacher who was already with a turtle, we, there's a strict policy of non-confrontation. Don't challenge them, don't tell them they shouldn't be doing that walk away okay you would take a log of where the um uh, of where the nest was being because you could go back later perhaps and uh, record uh, further data or you can go back and recover any eggs that they haven't managed to uh, uh, to take um but generally speaking you avoid concentration at uh, uh, at all costs with these people and we used only red lights and dark clothing because you know the uh, uh, bright clothing and, and white lights are, uh, are not great for uh, uh, for turtles. So if we were doing uh, tagging nesting females, relocation of clutches and release of neonates, it's all about keeping the uh, the light down to uh, uh, to a minimum. So the hatchery, um, just constant um, supervision required. So the majority of nests were guarded because protection and control provided in the hatchery is better. If you put them all in, into one place and you can guard them effectively, then um, that is uh, going to be much more secure. If you bury a nest in a better place on the beach, perhaps, then poachers can be hiding in the vegetation because the vegetation comes right up to the beach edge. Once you've walked away, then the, the poachers can just walk on and, uh, and take the eggs that you have so carefully buried. So it is, very much the aim that they try to relocate every nest that they find. Some of them, though, are reburied in a safer position on the beach for a variety of reasons. For instance, you may have been out having uh, and already got one uh, nest that you have recovered. You need to get the eggs back. You see another nest, so you are going to have to uh, uh, to wait for that to. Um, um, uh, so you're going to have to um, wait until you've got the physical capacity to take those eggs back. So it's best to bury it somewhere else rather than try to carry uh, eggs for more than uh, than one nest. I just admit one more person who's come into the waiting room. So just put them on my screen. Um, One of the big problems, I've mentioned it already, was crabs. I mean, the sheer numbers of crabs that were on that beach site were, were just astonishing. You know, if you, uh, um, I think I was having nightmares for weeks afterwards where I would wake up in a, uh, in a beach hut and uh, look at the floor and there would be row after row of crabs uh, in front of me um, uh, with one claw up in the air. And, uh, you know, they, after dark, certainly you couldn't, uh, you couldn't really move for them. And on one occasion, even in the morning when we were having breakfast, a uh, crab fell from the roof of the uh, of the structure where we were eating breakfast. So it was a, a little um, uh, uh, big uh, marquee-like structure. And to have a, a, a very large crab clattered down from the roof and land in the middle of the table uh, was a bit of a shock for uh, uh, for those people involved. But if you don't, if you allow them into the hatchery and you don't remove them, then they will get into the nest and they will prey on the nest because obviously crab needs something to eat. We also know that wild dogs and other mammals uh, will also dig up the nest. So, so feral, feral dogs rather than wild dogs, I guess, will dig up the nest and will eat the eggs. 
And we also know that you get a lot of ant infestations that ruin the nest by introducing infections. So there are always lots of ants in these uh, uh, tropical climes, of course. So trying to keep the ants out was another major, uh, a major task. And you would do up to six hour shifts, so depending on the number of volunteers available. But if there was no one available to take over, you just had to stay there because there was uh, no way that these things could be left for a very long period of time at all. You also had to patrol the hatchery every 15 minutes. So you're looking not just for these um, uh, predators getting in, but you're looking into the nest themselves with a, with a, a, a torch as, as quickly as you can. And you're looking for the emergence of any hatchlings. So are the hatchlings starting to come out of the nest? Uh, we were told to look for um, uh, bubbling of the sand. So they, they, it looks as if the sand is a liquid that has come to the boil. Uh, and that's the sign that the hatchlings are ready to emerge. Sadly, in the time that we were there, none of the, the nests that we had planted there came to uh, maturity, if you like. We did find other nests on the beach and we were able to work with hatchlings for that time. But you know, after we went home, when the, all of a sudden the many pairs of hands had disappeared, uh, they ended up having to deal with all of the, um, uh, the nesting uh, emergencies themselves. So it's uh, hard work for those people that were involved. So here we're collecting uh, the eggs. So this is uh, one of um, George's uh, photographs. I have to say, I keep looking at this photograph and I see a nativity scene, but um, it's not really meant to be that. Uh, you can see the very uh, large turtle here and people gathering at the rear of the turtle. So you're waiting for her to actually dig her nest out. Uh, once she's done the nest out, she will get into position and start to lay eggs. So you get a plastic bag underneath the back of the turtle and you um, hopefully catch the eggs uh, in the plastic bag and the and uh, mother turtle is uh, completely uh, oblivious to this process apparently. Once she's finished laying she will turn around and start to cover up the nest uh, and then she will make her way back to the sea covering her tracks as she goes because um, obviously um, um, it's in their interest so that uh, to cover up the pathway to the nest because otherwise you're going to lead uh, predators to them. So um, it's uh, um, obviously silence is uh, is required and you know the, the picture's dark because of the amount of light that was uh, required and this indeed is one of George's pictures who's in the room with us today so thank you George. The, um, sorry. Um, as well as collecting the eggs, you made measurements of the depth and width of the nest. And once the turtle, turtle starts to cover the nest, then the egg bag's pulled out of the hole gently and located in a safe place. Then you can get on with measuring the turtle, so collecting the biometric data for the turtle. So you measure the carapace width and length of the nesting uh, female, uh, and you do each measurement three times. So, you know, the old saying amongst the builders is measure twice and manufacture once, isn't it? Well, in, in biology, it's a measure three times and then tell the, uh, the scientists what the uh, correct answer is. Okay? So you do it three times and dictate it clearly to the person writing down the data. Nesting females that didn't have tags or those who were about to lose tags were had their tags replaced for further studies. But of course, when you're dealing with an animal this size, compared to the original hatchling, which is that sort of size, uh, you can't tag them as babies effectively. So because they're just gonna get so big that the tags will, be, uh, will fall off. So you can only tag the adults effectively. So when they, are, uh, uh, when they come back to the beach, you check them for further, uh, or for the existence of a tag. And if they haven't got one, then you add another tag. You then take the nests away, so the, you take them to the hatchery and the replica nests are dug by the volunteers to a specified depth, which is about 75 centimetres, which um, Sandra discovered was just a little bit longer than the length of her arm. Uh, so she had great difficulty getting uh, uh, all the way down to the bottom of the nest. And you have to dig it in a Wellington boot design, because the way the turtle does it is to dig the, uh, the, 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 the toe, sorry, the uh, the leg of the boot, and then there is an antechamber at the bottom, so they dig it out uh, for where the foot will go. So you place the eggs in the nest in exactly the same way as the turtle would. So that involved placing some of them in the, uh, the toe of the boot, and then stacking the rest of them up the leg. And the yolkless eggs, the ones that the turtle tend to lay last, are the ones that are placed on top. And it's thought that these yolkless eggs actually create the function of uh, create an airspace on top of the nest so that when the um, uh, when the hatchlings emerge inside the nest there is some space and some uh, some oxygen for them as they try to dig their way out and get to the uh, and get to the surface 
once you've relocated the eggs, then it's simply a question of waiting and monitoring for emerging hatchlings. So typically, they will come out after somewhere between sort of 60 and 65 days. Um, if you if they haven't emerged after 70 days, then they were tended to be um, um, well, exhumed. So you dig it out to see what was happening and see if there, there was a problem with the nest and if you could um, save any uh, particular hatchlings. So here are our emerging hatchlings. So the, um, this was from one of the nests that we recovered on the beach. So you can see you get an awful lot of hatchlings in each individual nest. So they, um, uh, on this particular slide, they're in a bucket waiting to have some safe transport uh, to an area of the beach where they can be released. So from every nest, you take 15 neonates and you measure the uh, length and width of the carapace with a, with a caliper and you can get some idea of the size, obviously, from this photograph. You record the weight as well with a, with a small scale and use latex gloves uh, and handling them as gently as possible for, to avoid stressing or disorienting them. In fact, when the um, hatchlings are taken out of the nest, you put them into sand with cold seawater. And the aim of that is to slow their metabolism down so that they don't get overexcited and, uh, uh, and over-energized and waste the energy that they will need in order to, uh, uh, to get to the beach. So once, you have, um, once you've got your hatchlings ready for release, then you take them to different parts of the beach. If you release them all on one part of the beach, then the predators know we'll wait here because they're going to release some hatchlings and that's going to be food. So you take them to lots of different parts of the beach to, uh, to release them. So you don't want to create known feeding areas for predators. And it's also vital that you place them high up the beach. The turtle hatchling has to imprint where this beach is because they will be coming back here later in their lives with females to lay their own eggs. Okay, So it's really important that you give them chance to imprint uh, on the beach. And it's one of those remarkable biological, biological stories, isn't it? As how animals can roam across the world but still find themselves back to approximately the same stretch of beach. So tend to do some releases at night time um, so you could uh, avoid uh, disorienting the neonates but during the daytime you tended to do the uh, releases um, at about five o'clock when the temperature was going down so you didn't want to release them at particularly high uh, uh, levels of temperature and you can see here the hatchling making its way towards the uh, uh, towards the sea and it's uh, it takes some time to get there and it's uh, it feels um, uh, it, it, it's um, you get quite a buzz when you're the turtle hatchling you've been following actually makes it and manages to uh, to swim off. Once the um, um, hatchlings have been recovered, then you would exhume the nest. And sometimes you had to do this on nests that hadn't emerged at all. So you would uh, dig into the nest and dig out the um, uh, um, the remnants of, the, of what was inside. And you're looking to work out the percentage of the neonates that have actually emerged the number of live or dead neonates that remain inside the nest and obviously if they're still alive you can take them out and help them uh, to uh, to be released. We also wanted to analyse the unhatched eggs so Fabian who is our scientist is sitting here collecting the uh, the data and dictating to one of the other scientists the uh, state of uh, uh, the embryonal development for the eggs and you can see here at his feet we have a pile of the eggs which uh, uh, had not uh, had not hatched. So you would always want to do your exhumation within 24 or 48 hours after the first emergence, or you do it at 70 days after the nesting day if no neonates had emerged. And you would, uh, from every nest, you look for the number of eggshells, the number of live neonates and dead neonates were recorded, and eggs that were not hatched were open to estimate the embryonal development. So you can see on this slide here that there are four recognized stages of embryo development. So the aim is to record which of the states of embryonal development the uh, uh, the unhatched egg uh, had got to? You know, so it's obviously um, if it's uh, if it's stage one, then it, it's an early failure in development. If it gets to stage four, then it's a, a late failure uh, in development too. Then you calculate the hatching rate, so the percentage of hatching and emergence calculated using the, this formula. So P is the percentage of hatching, and C is the empty shells and N is the total number of eggs. Um, so it's fairly straightforward biological uh, uh, mathematics to help you to work out how many uh, eggs were um, uh, uh, had emerged. Um, excuse me a moment. <coughs> so in terms of nesting activities then, there are two things to record. One is, did a turtle come to the beach at any point? And two is, 
did that female turtle actually dig a nest and lay any eggs? So the blue bars on the chart here are the, uh, the total activities. So you can see that in 2012, there were a large number of visits to the, uh, uh, to the beach that were recorded, but uh, you know, just over 800, but only just over 500 of them actually resulted in the mum laying any eggs. They may have been disturbed for any reason at all and decided to go back into the sea or uh, what other uh, reasons, uh, you know, there could be any, a number of reasons why they decided not to lay. 2013 was a, a poor year for the, uh, uh, for the number of nests actually dug, as with 2014. Biosphere got involved in 2015, and I'm not saying that this is the cause of the number of nests going up. It, it, it may well be coincidental, but the number of nests did go up. Dropped again in 2016, uh, and remained pretty steady 2017 and, uh, and 2018. So we had, in the time we were there in 2018, a total of 392 nesting activity uh, recorded um, and 241 of them were successful and resulted in viable nests. So slightly below average, but uh, it's within the uh, what you would consider to be the normal range. But what is important are the number of nests that were recovered. So you can see on this particular slide here, the number of protected nests was 65%. So that is the, uh, the best figure that they've achieved. Um, 2019, uh, it took a slight dip, but more nests were made in 2019 as well. So this was the highest number of nests that were uh, saved um, um, uh, since the project started in 2012. So 89% of those nests that were saved were relocated to the hatchery and 11%, so 17 nests had to be relocated to a safe place on the beach. So they, uh, uh, most of them indeed came back to the, uh, for the hatchery. And you can see here that the emergence success, 69.28 um, uh, uh, of the, um, um, uh, of the nests actually resulted in the emergence. So quite a significant number. So 69.28 in total. Um, the numbers in the hatchery were higher. When you take into account the numbers of uh, uh, nests that emerged that were left on the beach, then it dragged it down a little bit to 67%. But it's still a really good result. And there were 8,112 hatchlings that emerged from these nests. So that's 8,112 uh, Atling turtles that otherwise would not have made it to the beach because we know that when the project started, the years before the project started, almost all of these nests were taken. So none of these um, um, neonates would have uh, made it to the beach. So what happens to these hatchlings then? Well, the truth of the matter is that we uh, don't really know because the males never return to the beach. Uh, the females come back to the beach after about 15 years, okay, they return to their stretch of beach and what happens in the intervening period is a bit of a mystery. So there's a complete paucity of information on this. So it's, uh, it's an interesting study, um, but the means of conducting it are probably uh, uh, beyond us, I'm afraid. Um, I think you can safely say that quite a lot of the hatchlings fall prey themselves, so they will be taken by, uh, uh, by, by fish and sharks and so forth, and, and quite a lot of them will just die. Uh, but um, the truth of the matter is that we don't really know. So what happened next after 2018? Well, in 2019, the project continued. There were more nests identified, so that's good news, but fewer were recovered as a percentage because there's only a certain amount of time, a, limp, a certain number rather, that a limited team can actually uh, uh, recover. Um, but of course, 2020 and 2021, all visits were suspended uh, due to COVID. So there has been no work carried out uh, on the beach by the international scientists. The locals have tried to continue, uh, but uh, you know, the extent of the work they can do is obviously uh, much lower than they can with the support. And it's generally true that the local economy in Costa Rica has been badly hit by the pandemic and the absence of tourism. So the, uh, the danger is that members of that community will return to poaching as well. So we've, uh, we're not expecting the uh, impact on the turtles to be good, but we can say that it's not known at this time. But if you wanted to join them, uh, the project restarts again in May of 2022. And um, you know, we would certainly uh, recommend it for you. If you want to see some more um, um, report, more scientific data in the report, you can follow these links here, and you know, I will make these available to anybody who wants them. These are the um, final reports as published on the Biosphere website. So every Biosphere project 
has a proper scientific report issued for, uh, for it, as well as um, various uh, articles published in journals and so forth. So, you know, we are generally supporting the work of, of scientists who are going on to publish. So there's lots of things out there. Now, just very briefly, because I know we were talking for um, 40 minutes, you know, Sandra and I have not just been to Costa Rica with Biosphere, we've done other uh, projects as well. So we, we went to Namibia in 2013, our first one really, to work with uh, leopards, cheetahs and, and elephants, uh, looking at the impact of human populations and the economy. Um, we went to Dubai to work on the Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve. So there's a, a project there to uh, restore the Arabian Oryx into Dubai because the uh, uh, the natural population had almost been wiped out. They had some individuals left that they had to move back to um, uh, to Kentucky to conserve them while they managed to uh, build a reserve there. So they uh, they've brought them back now, and that population is absolutely thriving thriving so much that they need to consider reintroducing Arabian wolf into Dubai uh, and uh, they keep thinking about this and not quite taking that final step uh, so they need to really make a decision as to what they want and uh, 2019 something I went to Malawi to work on uh, biodiversity surveys in the Vawaza marsh reserve so we're looking there with elephants, hippos, bats and, um, and insects so one of the tasks in Namibia was always to um, set camera traps so that you could look for some of these um, uh, organisms. Um, so you're looking for the different animals. So we have here a, um, um, a small cat that was wandering around the project and we had a rather bigger cat. So this um, leopard walked past one of our cameras at, uh, at 20 to 6 in the evening. So you've, uh, it, you can see that this particular animal has got some damage to its jaw. This animal was caught the week after we um, uh, we left uh, Namibia and uh, was uh, the damage to its jaw was repaired by the uh, by the local vet. Um, more of the smaller cats and we have some nice sequence here of another leopard walking right past the camera. So in this particular um, animal, Sam and I had found its tracks and uh, we told the, uh, the scientist that we were sure we'd found some leopard tracks and she looked at the photographs and said, no, no, I, I think that's a hyena. We were convinced it was a leopard. So we were delighted when the, the camera images actually, uh, actually came out. Go the right way. We were also present here, these branches here, we put these branches on the road to stop any vehicle coming down this particular road that we were on. Uh, and we left them there when we moved away. And um, literally within half an hour, this family of cheetahs had come to have a look. So there are um, three cheetahs in total in these photographs. So they just came along to have a good nosy about what we were doing. There were lots of hyenas around. So you can see that we saw them moving around, especially uh, after dark. And our camera trap did catch this rather wonderful picture of, uh, 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 of an antelope kicking um, at the waterhole. So that's, uh, uh, that image has, uh, uh, has won a few prizes over the years. So we'll, um, and considering it wasn't taken by a human with a camera, it was just a, a, a box strapped to a tree. I think it's a, it's a really good image. Probably the best ones though, and the ones that most people like are these pictures of a leopard coming towards the camera. So very inquisitive leopard indeed. And you can see that it's been caught this leopard before because they, it has just on its neck there, it has the uh, um, uh, a tracking device. So this is one of the leopards that they've been following. It basically sends a text message every 12 hours telling the scientist where it is. Uh, so it's more reliable than your average teenager, uh, but um, it's certainly a, 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 an inquisitive animal. Um, we have this lovely uh, picture of cheetahs again as well, so walking around the uh, one of the water holes, and there's three of them. Apparently this is mum and two daughters, um, so the, the, the male cheetahs are forced out and have to go make their own way in the world, but the, uh, uh, the females will, uh, uh, will stay together. Um, that is just three so-called <laughs> citizen scientists. Um, um, uh, one Australian, one German, and, uh, and uh, uh, oh, sorry, two Germans, I beg your pardon. Uh, and this is the last photograph that was taken by the camera. Um, so the camera trap was found um, on the floor, smashed open with its batteries eaten. Um, so um, I think even your average um, uh, police officer would be able to figure out who the culprit was uh, in this particular case. But uh, 
he, um, he, he certainly, I don't think, would particularly have enjoyed his meal. <laughs> <laughs>